Hey everyone, and welcome back to I'm a Fan. I'm your host, Kimber Eberly. He has toured internationally through a 25-year career with nine album releases. He's been playing keyboard for the John Fogarty Band since 2011. He's been a session player on countless um, musicians' albums, including Ringo Starr and Avel Lavigne. Um, the list is long. His recording of You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch, was the theme of 2018, the movie The Grinch. He has a new album out now called Good People, and I'm so happy to have him today. Welcome, Bob Malone. Um, so thank you for coming, Bob. I'm so happy to have you here. Actually, I'm really honored to have you here. I haven't seen you um, for a long time, um, and we'll get to that. I want to start off with your childhood and how you um, became a piano player, like where it all where it all began. Was it your parents? Tell me about it. Yeah, you know, I was kind of a um, obnoxiously restless kid, <laughs> had a lot of interests, couldn't sit still, needed uh, to be doing something all the time. And we had like this uh, <clears throat> this home organ in our house that my dad played for fun after work. And they were like, you should take some lessons. So I took lessons. So I learned like classical organ. And the I guess the first year... Uh, How old were you? Nine. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. And uh, the first year, like, not much was going on. And my mom didn't want me to quit. And she was like, I, she noticed that I liked to play when people were watching me. Yeah. You know, I liked to perform. Like, even before I played music, I liked to perform, you know. I used to put on these little shows with the kids next door when we were, like, six. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, I loved to perform, but I wasn't that interested in playing playing the organ. And my mom was like, "If you practice, just practice fifteen minutes a day, and I'll watch you play." So that worked for me. So I had an audience, had an audience of one. As long as I had an audience, I was like, "Oh, I want to play." And so uh, that went on for a few months, and all of a sudden, something clicked in, and I could really play. And then from that point on. They couldn't tear me away. And then uh, I really wanted a piano. So we got a piano. So I learned to play both instruments. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I used to go, my lessons were in this, like, piano and organ store on Route 46 in Total in New Jersey, right down oh, the street wow. from of Wayne, which is the store that mm -hmm. the band named themselves after. Just a little New Jersey trivia for you there. Huh. Okay. So, uh, I uh, I used to like get my mom to take me there early because if I just like started playing, whoever was in there shopping or whatever would crowd around and watch. Nice. And so that was, so that was my big show every week. <laughs> <laughs> I get to my lesson early, and you know, rip on a piano, and people would crowd around. So that's how it all began. Wow. So did you um, go to college then for music, or uh, yeah, did you study? I went to Went to Berkeley College of Music. Oh, uh, okay. In, music. in Boston, right? Yeah, in Boston, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I was playing in bars by the age of 16, you know. Wow, yeah. And, uh, um, and you play accordion, too. I yeah. You play accordion. What's the different? how different is that? That looks like such a hard instrument to play because you do it a couple weird. things. It's, yeah. it's a completely different instrument. I mean, I didn't get it till I was, I got it when I was 30. <clears throat> so I never had like kid accordion lessons. Yeah. I got it because I wanted to do some like, well, I got two calls in one week for, for recording sessions on accordion. And I just said yes, because I didn't, I wanted the money. And I, and I had been thinking about buying accordion anyway, to do like New Orleans Cajun stuff on. Right? Yeah. So, uh. I figured, oh, that's my excuse. I had a week. So I went out and I bought this <laughs> accordion. Same that's one sweet. I still have. Same one I play with John Fogarty oh. and uh, my little blue accordion. So I bought it for $100. And I had maybe a day at that point to figure out how to play it before the first session. And uh, <laughs> that's when I realized that it was not just like strapping on a keyboard and playing, yeah. you know. Yeah. The keys were 
smaller than regular piano keys. It was sideways. And then he had to remember to keep pumping, you know, when you were like, so I'd get going pretty good. And then I'd forget to do this <laughs> part and then it would just go silent. So it I showed up at the hard. session yeah. and it was just kind of like, you know, like a Americana tune where I was playing pads under guitar stuff. So it wasn't a hard part, but it took me way too long to do it. Yeah. And uh, because I really didn't know, <laughs> but I got through the sessions. So I, I love the story about um, how you know when we when you and I first met, the year and everything. So you can tell us a little bit about that. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, because well, I invite, yeah, I invited you to a show in Staten Island to play. It, it was my first show. Actually, I think Craig Spector was involved with that. Yeah, Craig Spector yeah. hooked us up. Yeah. And uh, it was 2003, the year I got married. Yeah. yeah, and that's amazing, like, how you remember that, because I couldn't remember what year it was, and you're like, oh, I got married. I don't know why I remember that. It's not like I remember a lot of stuff like that. <laughs> it just, yeah. I just remember that one because it was, I remember, like, everything about that year, because it was kind of a big, hairy year for me. So, uh, anyway, yeah, I went over there in a snowstorm, right, and we taped the show, and Craig came, and Yes. He set up all these can. He made the set look great. There you go. Just kind yeah. of a blank warehouse, empty kind of set, and he yeah, yeah, he did all this great looking stuff. I was like, damn, who knew you're a writer and you can you know decorate? So. Yeah, Cal I, I always laugh because somebody said Calgon, take me away or something. Yeah, was, I, like, I <laughs> but canceled. that was about right. If there was a bathtub, I could have sank down in, down in it, be covered <laughs> with something. Like with the candles, Calgon, take me away. Yeah. <laughs> but but what you don't know about that show, that was my director debut, right, for, for the show. Yeah, you told me about that, so you didn't oh know my, what you were doing. <laughs> no, I froze like a deer in headlights, you know, and Kenny's mm -hmm. behind me, who who is one of the producers of the show at the time, um, and he's like, camera two, camera three. Came in, I'm sitting there, I didn't do anything, and then he just pushed me off the chair. I literally took over. So I didn't even direct that show. Right. <laughs> like, but I, I really enjoyed the songs you did. They were amazing, the songs. And well, the good. stories that you told. I remember one story about, um, you were telling us about an audience that you played for that you knew they were um, Jerry, senior citizens. You were playing for a show because most of them had no teeth or something. <laughs> well, I don't think they were senior citizens. I think they were just, um, you know, from out where the buses don't run. <laughs> <laughs> you know. so, okay. So All good. right. So um, uh, moving forward, you, well, at that time too, I think you published a book uh, because music was transitioning into this big, Thing where they didn't sign artists anymore. They you, you sort of became on your own touring, and I think you were among the first to talk about managing your being your own manager and and booking your own jobs. And it was like a how to do guide. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, there was this book uh, Harper Collins put out called Working Musicians, and they interviewed. There was a bunch of pieces with different people, and I wrote one. Mine was about being like an indie touring musician, playing your own music, which, yeah, I was just right in that vanguard, right in that age group of people who uh, discovered they could just go have a career playing their own stuff and not need a record deal to do it. 
And you know, yeah, a lot how of them, hard, how hard was that? I mean, how'd you go about doing that? It's hard, you know, everything's hard. I mean, I just was, it's just, you have to work 10 times harder than everybody else. Like I, I moved to LA and I was doing kind of like bar gigs and stuff to like to eat, you know, and pay my rent playing cover tunes or whatever. And, uh, and I was shopping my stuff around to various um, labels and stuff like that. I got a publishing deal mm. and it looked like I was going to get a record deal. And then the guy at the publishing company had a nervous breakdown and disappeared and we never saw him again. Mm. And so none of that worked out. Wow. And at that point I was like probably 30 by then ancient <laughs> by record well, by company standards. Right. So I was faced with either I'm going to do these miserable, like four sets a night of playing cover tunes, or I'm going to just do my thing and not compromise and make a career out of it. So I started doing that and then I ended up with a really good following, just playing my, my show, you know, around Southern California. And then I started touring solo around the mid nineties. And, uh, and I just kept doing it. I remember I, constructed this email that was the other thing email was just happening right when i decided to do all this oh, and for a while that, people that were totally inaccessible before you could suddenly correspond with because they you could send you know usually I had to go through some secretary or some you know layers of people to get to the person you want and uh this was new they weren't getting a lot of emails and so i I targeted venues I wanted to play that were venues where people played their own music and, and uh, people listened to you, you know, that's what yeah. I wanted. And, uh, and I was able to, uh, so I made this email to pitch, like to be an opening act for, you know, and get, uh, get a following in these rooms and uh, they would get back to me. You know, I, I'd make it easy for them, pick a date that I wanted to do and, Usually they're like, oh, great. So we can, we don't have to go looking for an opening act. We can just get this guy, <laughs> you know, and there was no money involved, but if I did a really great show, people would buy a lot of stuff. And that's, mm -hmm. that was my motivation to have a hotel room as opposed to sleeping in my car. I just did a, you know, full on high energy show every night by myself, uh, touring. I had the band yeah. back in LA, but I couldn't tour with that yet. Mm -hmm. And that's how it all started. And I just yeah. built up my own following doing that. Is it different playing in to a European crowd than it is to an American crowd? I don't know. They're all, you know, they all like it. You know, European crowds are, they're really appreciative. You know, they tend to be easier to warm up. Like, I don't know. The thing is, when I play to a crowd now, it's a crowd that's come to see me. So, right. One's not more, they're all predisposed to like me, you know? <laughs> yeah. And just so you know, the oddest thing happened. So since you, you know, you're going to come to Staten Island in April and play at the Hub, um, what's interesting, somebody recently just posted a picture of you and him on Facebook. And he was one of my friends that plays in a band here. He plays keyboards. And, and I messaged him and, I, and, he, and I'm like, how do you know Bob? And he, he said he went to a concert of yours, and he's a fan. And, and, you know, ever since then, like, he plays piano. And he and I told him, well, he's coming to Staten Island in April. And he goes, oh, I'm getting tickets. So I'm already, okay. you know, I already seen people that want to come and see. see right, so we got here. one. <laughs> no, I actually have about five already. All right, good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting. So um, um, let's, uh, would you play a song for us? Yeah. Storefronts glitter with a million dreams. But there'll be none of that for my baby and me. still feel the air and we've got the will but not the means we ain't never seen times quite so lead as these oh, 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 oh. and 
and it's Christmas. We got nothing but the ground below. The stars above and it's Christmas. We got nothing, nothing but love. Oh, yeah. It don't matter how bad we're doing. There's still laughter near the ruins. Disarray and debts unpaid. Still the joyous music plays. And with things we want are out of reach. But baby, we've got everything we need. Oh, 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 oh. And it's Christmas. We got nothing but the ground below. The stars above and it's Christmas. We got nothing, nothing but love. When the ornaments reappear from the box in the closet where they had all year. And just ghost of a better Christmas past. Waiting just to reappear at last and it's Christmas but we got nothing but the ground below the stars above and it's Christmas but we got nothing nothing but love and it's Christmas but we got nothing but the ground below the stars above and it's Christmas but we got nothing nothing but love Nothing but love, nothing but love. All right. So is that a new Christmas song you wrote or? Uh... Not new, but it's on my, I wrote it. Yeah, it's on my Christmas record that I put out in 2018. Yeah. So it gets like that record gets one month of of action like every year, so <laughs> it's only five months old really in, in Christmas years, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. I I want um, you to talk about how you got involved with John Fogarty's band, um, how you met him, where where that all started. Uh, I got a call. You know, I had a mutual colleague friend. Uh, they were looking for a keyboard player and I got this call from this friend of mine. He's like, yeah, you're probably going to get a call from, from the Fogarty's. They're looking for a, look for a new keyboard player. Uh, you know, I really hounded them to hire you, give you an audition. And so nobody called and about six months went by and then out of the blue, they called and I went over there. And uh, I auditioned in his garage, in the Hollywood Hills, very large garage, you know. And uh, it was his two kids who are now in a band mm. playing you know, bass and drums and uh, the guitar tech playing guitar and his wife who manages him and kind of runs everything. Oh, wow. Okay. Fair, fair. Yeah, she was there and Bob Fogarty, his brother, who runs the day-to-day -day operation uh they were there no john and so i uh i played the first song and i think they were just doing like a, they hadn't heard of me but they didn't know who i was and they wanted somebody they already knew mm -hmm. as people yeah. often do which i get I, i'm like that like when i have to call a sub or something i'm like ah oh, i don't want to call somebody i don't know yeah. anyway they yeah. didn't know me so i think they were just doing it to get you know uh get my friend like off their back so uh <laughs> anyway i did the first tune and then everyone starts getting real excited and i did a second tune and and julie his wife like taped it on her phone and then she's like hold on a minute and she ran inside she was in there for like 20 minutes and she comes back out with john mm, and so yeah. and then i played a couple of more songs and uh they gave me the gig and i think the very first like month i was in a band we went to russia so uh went directly to rush after getting the gig and so that was 11 years ago i'm still in the band is that intimidating like to go to a star of such caliber to to audition like that 
Because I, I know mm. you you um, went to Ringo Starr's house too, I believe. <laughs> so yeah, cool. I did a session for Ringo. That was intimidating. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to play. Yeah, that's a Beatle. That's a whole, you know, in the pantheon of rock stars, there's the Beatles, you know, and then there's everything else. Yeah. So uh, it was, it was, uh, and like all your famous rockers that came after the Beatles will tell you the same thing, you know. So uh, uh, that was intimidating, but it was good. It was a fun session. I played fine. He liked yeah. it. It's cool. I, I, the audition I, was not, you know, it was not scary. I mean, you know, I got, I was all hyped up to do it, but I, you know, I didn't really know what I was going to play. So I learned like all of his hits and ended up playing maybe two of the songs. Mostly they asked me to play like old fifties rock tunes. It's like artists want to know artists figure you're going to learn their songs, but they kind of want you to like what they like, like know what they yeah. know, like, you know, like he grew up on a certain kind of music that he loved. And like, if I was not interested in that, I wouldn't be the right person for him. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Of course. Sir, I'm going to ask you to play another song for us. All right, cool.
one of one of you you have a new album out called Good People. Yeah. And Good People, when I first heard that and you released it, oh my God, I cried. It was such a beautiful, beautiful song, and 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 I think I recently asked you if if that was out of COVID, and you told me no. Which no, it was before really before COVID. Yeah, that surprised me because it's so pertinent to today. You know that song and the words and just so beautiful. And there was another song you wrote around that time too. That, yeah, my friend. Um, finished the last song for that record the day everything shut down and 
March 2020. I was actually in the studio cutting the last tune for that record. Yeah. <clears throat> Wow. And, uh, wow. And, you, and I, I would just basically sat on it for the year because I didn't want to put it out that year. So yeah. it ended up coming out in 2021. Yeah, such a such a be such beautiful songs. And um, uh, thank God, you know, it tamed down a little bit and you're able to come back out because that must have been awful. Um, I know a lot of musicians that were struggling around that time to make ends meet. Yeah. I know you did fun. some performances on stage it which was great you know you came yeah. to our homes which was really cool i'm um, doing one on uh the 11th i don't know if it's airs before is then. that your christmas one right yeah yeah yes um so what's next for you i mean you're touring you you have so much on your plate you're touring with john fogarty you, you're touring with your own band um yeah. it is is I know that keeps you super busy. Is there anything you know you personally want to do that's on your list? Uh, I want to record some new stuff, and I've got tour dates next year. I'm off for the rest of the year. Oh, good, good. <clears throat> and uh, you know, I, I I'm just working on some some things. I actually uh, I had a uh, my junior high band director was this incredibly talented guy. Like, I don't know how he ended up really uh, teaching junior high music to us kids in the, uh, my little school, like looking back, I didn't know at the time, but anyway, he was the first person I ever met that like wrote music. And he wrote this music that we, we did a show like a multimedia thing. And, and uh, it was just great. It really, uh, I was probably 12 or whatever. Mm. And uh, it really shaped me as a musician, these, this yeah. music that he wrote, like just the time in which it happened. And it was it was quite good, you know. And so I kept I had like the handwritten scores from that. I kept them all these years and they were in my parents like attic. And then they so I got a hold of them a few years ago and I started like going through it <clears throat> with the idea that maybe I'd record this stuff and I kept trying to get a hold of him to see, you know, to talk to him. I hadn't talked to the guy in, you know, since 1979, you know, or oh, 19, wow. I guess 1980 was my last year of junior high, you know, so I hadn't seen him, you know, for ages, he retired, but he was not online at all. He was like, not findable. I could not find him. Oh, wow. So, uh, uh, and I was kind of bummed, but I was like, you know, working for this and doing some orchestration for it. Cause all I had was like, the piano score i didn't really have all the part anyway and then out of the blue i get a notice from somebody that he had died in oh. 20 2020 oh. so uh i never was able to talk to him but i i, I next year i want to record that stuff and debut it somewhere in new jersey oh wow you know wow. uh it deserves to be heard it's really great stuff and it never got heard by anybody except us kids and whoever came to that concert you know, anyway. Uh, wow, that's very gonna, sentimental. <laughs> I'm going to work on that. Yeah, you know, it's sentimental to me. Maybe it's not as good as I think it is, but it's so embedded. <laughs> in my, I think it is. But, you know, it's so embedded in my formative being as a musician. Like, I can't overestimate how much of an impact it had. Like, I'd never met somebody who could do that, like, in person, you know. And... Yeah. uh Anyway, uh, that's well, part of that's something I want to work on next year. Now um, I've publicly said it. I, I have to come. You have to do it. <laughs> I have you to actually what? finish it. Now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think whatever it is, Bob, you'll make it beautiful. So um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, That'll be I, I want to thank you um, for your time, and I I am definitely looking forward to seeing you in April. Um, perform at Hub 17 and being in New York, uh, I know you're you're doing a short tour in the in the springtime. Yeah. And um, yeah, I can't wait. Um, and um, that's pretty much it. And uh, let us know with your your new CDs whenever you know you release one. I'm I'm on your fan page, and I just want you to know I'm a fan. So good. Yeah. Hence and, the name. And, <laughs> yeah, hence the name. And and I've been for such a long time. Um and you're one of a kind. You really are. 
Oh, thank so you. So until then, I have a Merry Christmas. Same to uh, you. We'll be looking forward to your shows on Stage It that you're doing next week. Next week. And, yeah, yeah um, next Sunday. This coming yeah. Sunday. Yeah. I'll probably do a New Year's one, too. Oh, cool. Oh, very I cool. always hated playing New Year's, and I quit playing, except for, like, if I really liked the gig, I'd take a New Year's gig. So yeah. I've done very few over the last, like, 20 years, basically. Yeah. And, uh, all of them have been great. You know, before yeah, that, yeah. they were like, it was, you, you, you just felt like you had to play on New Year's. Anyway, so uh, yeah. for the last three years in a row, well, COVID year, obviously, there were no gigs. So that's when I did, um, did one at home and I loved it. Like people tuned in, they gave me money. I made money. I didn't have to go out and yeah. do a New Year's gig. I and mean, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. So now it's an annual thing, unless the occasional cool New Year's gig that I really want to do crops up, you know. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, we will talk to you very soon. Again, thank you so much, and have a wonderful holiday. And until then, um, we'll see you then. Yeah, same to you. Okay. Thanks for having me All on. Right. All right, and I'll bye. see you in the April. Yes, you will. We'll talk to All you right. then, I'm sure. All right. Yeah, we'll talk. Hold on a minute. See do you me. want to do one more song for us or no? Yes? Yeah, let's, uh, okay. let's see what happens. Carrie and she can't sleep at night. Toss sails and turns till the morning light. All right. The world's ugly, the world's not fair. She can't breathe through the hate in the air. There's good people everywhere I say there's good people everywhere Oh, there's good people everywhere When it seems like someone's always shooting up the place Getting in your face, making them lose your faith In the human race Just remember Good people everywhere. Came in, she wants to save the world. She tries hard, but she's just one girl. All right. Now it's her who needs to be saved from a world going up in flames. Feeling lost and afraid, I know. But believe me, you're not alone. Cause there's good people everywhere. I say there's good people everywhere. Oh, there's good people everywhere. When it seems like someone's always getting in your face. Shooting up the place, making you lose your faith in the human race. Just remember, there's good people everywhere. Beauty, it'll take you by surprise. Kindness in a stranger's eyes. Empathy, they say it's in short supply. But it's out there There's good people everywhere I say there's good people everywhere Oh, there's good people everywhere When it seems like someone's always getting in your face Shooting up the place Making them lose your faith In the human race just remember, there's good people everywhere. Just remember, there's good people everywhere. Everywhere.
live down by the river It gives me life I put down roots here Two kids and a wife Every day is a blessing And don't you think I know Sooner or later River bank gonna overflow The river gives The river takes away You can't stop The waters rise You can only pray The river gives Oh, the river takes away Down here by the river Swept away everything I've done. I stand on a ruin that was once my home. Nothing but nothing, as far as my eye can see. Can't help but wonder what will be. You can't stop the waters rise. You 